All right, class, uh, we're going to move into a medication uh, kind of near and dear to your heart. If you've ever got stitches before, this is the drug that they give you to numb you up. So, uh, But we've got a lot of uses for lidocaine, so we got a lot of things to cover with this. Um, and let's see, there's a little bit of humor here. Uh, yeah, where's lidocaine? The nurse is like, oh, my God, right? There we go. So what lidocaine hydrochloride, otherwise known as xylocaine, uh, again, and it's used to treat life-threatening dysrhythmias. It's also used as a local anesthetic. Uh, but it's got other uses as well, um, besides the anesthetic properties. It helps in decrease the endocranial spike uh, associated with using succinylcholine. And it actually prolongs a little bit of the succinylcholine effects. Um, so the class of drug that it is, is an antiarrhythmic, a class 1B. It's a sodium channel blocker, okay? So it blocks the sodium channels, which does not allow the ion exchange, therefore causing the numbness. It's a central nervous system agent, and it, again, we use it as a local anesthetic to numb, numb people up, uh, doing sutures. Uh, if you're going to start an IV, actually, you can inject just a small little bit of... Uh, 2% lidocaine up underneath the vein so it doesn't hurt near as bad. Um, so again, it pre it depresses ventricular automaticity. So it doesn't allow the, the impulse, allow it to generate its own impulse or allow it to be excited, especially during when you've got a, um, uh, uh, you've got irritated tissue. When you've got hypoxic tissue there, you've got damaged tissue, uh, the lidocaine actually prevents it from from depolarizing like it should, and, it's, and it does that through the phase four action. Um, and it can increase the ventricular fibrillatory threshold. So if you got a patient in V-fib, it makes it to where it's harder to enter that threshold. Uh, it does suppress a lot of re-entry arrhythmias. Um, so if you've got a an additional pathway between the atrium and the ventricles, instead of the, the bundle of hiss and the, and the AV node, again, it will help suppress those. And again, it blunts the, the, the chances of having in, intracranial pressure with RSI. But i got to stress that point. It prevents the spike from happening. It does not actually reduce intracranial pressure. So again, it uh, usually takes uh, less than three minutes IV to, um, to, to activate. One to two minutes if you go through the endotracheal tube. And the duration is roughly two to four hours. It takes a couple passes through the liver in order to get that get that out of the system. So we also use it to pre-medicate a patient uh, with before succinylcholine, especially if you have a closed head injury. We usually do this because it also helps block the vagal response with the with uh, using the laryngoscope blade. So again, as we lift, uh, that unfortunately stimulates the vagus nerve and can slow down the heart. Uh, again, it's an alternative to amiodarone and cardiac arrest for VFib, pulseless VTAC. Uh, the tw 2020 guidelines actually said, hey, you can use it interchangeably with the amiodarone, uh, which I'm personally glad of. But again, um, the amiodarone has good uses. We'll talk about it when we get to there. It is more of a potassium and sodium channel blockers. So it, it, it works upon a different mechanism, all right? But it's a very good ventricular dysrhythmic. Uh, if there's a problem with the ventricles, it's a great drug to use. Uh, it, again, it suppresses PVCs. Uh, if you are in VFib or VTAC, it is, it is a drug of choice for those. Uh, Post-cardioversion, again, to prevent them from going back into a lethal arrhythmia. And we also use it in pain management if you've started an IO. Uh, the drilling of an IO hurts very little. The... When you start pushing fluids through an IO, you'll want to come to Jesus, and it hurts. It, it hurts terribly, is what it hurts, and and you want to numb that cavity just like you would an IV uh, site. Uh, again, so again, by the way, uh, just as a reminder, you can use it to treat arrhythmias, but it can also give you arrhythmias. So be aware of that. Uh, let's see here, and some of the side effects, the big ones, blurred vision. Tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears, you could actually, if you give this medicine, can cause seizures. Uh, it's very common to get for them to, to get the euphoric, the lightheaded, a little bit of confusion. That's kind of a normal thing for central nervous system side effects on these guys. Uh, your cardiovascular effects, again, hypotension, 
Um, they can cause an arrhythmia. It will definitely slow down a heart rate. So if you got a slow heart, we don't give it at all. Uh, it can cause cardiac arrest. If you push it, you push it too fast. It can widen the QRS complex out. Um, all of these, again, nausea, vomiting is kind of a common side effect with this. And every now and then you'll get one who actually starts to break out and the rash has an anaphylactic reaction. Um, so again, if they know that they've got a, a history of sensitivity to the canes, um, they work on a little different mechanism, but they're all sodium channel blockers, so they can cause problems. Don't give lidocaine for that. If they have bradycardia and they're throwing PVCs, remember that a PVC is going to be a escape beat. And if you kill those, you will actually kill the patient because the backup mechanism, you're shutting down. All right. The high degree heart blocks, if the second, third degree heart blocks, if they have it, stay away from the lidocaine. Uh, matter of fact, if they have any bifascicular or um, or left bundle, right bundle branch blocks, you probably should not be using lidocaine. Uh, if they have a low blood pressure, again, uh, it's gonna you need to not give this drug. Okay, Stokes Adams syndrome, which is a sudden transient episode of syncope and occasionally featuring seizures. If you give it to a Stokes Adams patient, they will probably go into another seizure on you. They have Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Again, you're you're not going to give this drug. Uh, we don't just give it prophylactically for a, an acute heart attack. We just don't do it. Not anymore. Uh, when I first got into business, we did it was to prevent the patient from going into V-fib. We found out maybe that was a really bad idea. Again, a wide complex escape beats uh, with a bradycardia. Again, if it's bradycardia, we shouldn't be using this drug or any type of ventricular blocks. Again, we don't use it. Uh, if they're in AFib or a flutter, I would probably, there's better agents to use. I would not use uh, lidocaine on those folks, except for some really rare, dumb circumstances. Uh, and again, most of the time, that's going to be a doctor telling me what that dumb circumstance is and then to do it. Um, uh, there's been a great debate, by the way, which one's the better antidysrhythmic, whether it's amiodarone or lidocaine. Uh, I gotta be honest with you, um... I'm about six, one half dozen the other. It, it depends on the situation. It really does. Um, but I can tell you right now, usually for an antidysrhythmic, lidocaine is not your first line drug. It's your second line drug. We usually give the lidocaine more for the numbing agent or we're giving it for, again, uh, you're trying to blunt the, uh, the intracranial pressure when you're doing a drug-assisted intubation. Okay, uh, again, the problem is if you do give this drug, if you give uh, high doses of lidocaine, and again, it can extend out the life of succinylcholine. If uh, you got beta blockers or dopamine, it could uh, precipitate toxicity. It slows down processing in the liver. And the problem is if you give too much lidocaine, that's when you get the toxic effect, the seizures, the confusion, the, the low blood pressure. If they got congestive heart failure or MI, uh, which is kind of ironically... Uh, if you're having any of those things that are in the red on the screen, uh, you want to reduce the half. Uh, elderly patients, if they're over the age of 70, they've got any liver problems or renal problems, cut the dose in half, okay? It's better to give them a half dose and then another half dose and another half dose than to give them the full blast dose, okay? Uh, be careful using it simultaneously with any of these drugs up here. Uh, the reason that I say that is because, again, you could have a toxic effect from it. And again, the metabolic clearance in these patients, uh, uh, beta adrenergic blockers are patients with decreased cardiac function or liver function and disease. They, it is decreased. So again, if they're on a beta blocker, the OLOL drugs, uh, again, it's going to take longer for this drug to get out. Uh, usually 75 to 100 milligrams will maintain adequate blood levels for about 20 minutes. Usually when we give lidocaine, we actually give a maintenance drip with it, okay? So once we reach the therapeutic level for these folks, we continuously infuse it to maintain the level, all right? Uh, again, minimize the intracranial pressure spikes. The bradycardia occurs with PVCs. Uh, always treat the bradycardia first. And lidocaine is not your treatment for bradycardia. It is the exact opposite of what you should be using. All right, um... High doses of lidocaine can reduce, can end up in coma or death. And avoid lidocaine if you're going to have reperfusion arrhythmias after fibrinolytic therapy. So if you give the, the clot-busting drugs, I can guarantee you they're going to throw some 
arrhythmias. Lidocaine is probably not your drug to follow up with. All right. Cross reactivity with local anesthetics, so it will add to the effects if they're already under some sort of local anesthesia. Again, the drug is metabolized in the liver, all right? So it takes a time to get that out. And again, its half-life is kind of long. And again, um, usually we find it in the red box is 100 milligrams and 5 mLs, okay? Uh, the other way they do supply it is a premix of, of 1 gram and 500 mLs. And then the other way, we actually use it in lidocaine jelly. Um, so instead of KY jelly, the lidocaine jelly, it has a numbing effect so that the patient doesn't feel it as bad. Dosing. This is where it gets hairy. Um, dosing. Cardiac arrest. It's 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. IV push every 3 to 5 minutes. And then you repeat it with a half of a dose. Okay. So if I started out and I gave 100 milligrams, my second dose would be 50, third dose 50, up till I reach 3 milligrams per kilogram. My max dose is 3 milligrams per kilogram. And I can tell you right now, that is a healthy dose of lidocaine, okay? So, uh, a matter of fact, I'd be kind of leery getting up around the 3 milligram per kilogram range. If you have stable VTAC, wide complex tachycardia, again, we usually use a half of a dose of that. So again, 50, 0.5 to 0.75 milligrams a kilogram up to 1 to 1.5, okay? Uh, PVCs is usually 1.5 milligrams uh, per kilogram IV push, all right? And then you use half the dose again until you reach a max of 3 milligrams per kilogram. For RSI, it's usually 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. Guys, if you do 1 milligram per kilogram, that's fine. Okay? Uh, kind of depends on the protocol. The protocols usually say 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. If you're giving it to numb up the IO, you're going to give it through the IO, and you're going to push it about 20 milligrams. It's actually 20 to 40 milligrams uh, IO, and you push it. You can repeat that one time. Again, this is to numb the inside of the bone cavity where all the nerves are, okay? If you're going to do a maintenance infusion, all right, this is the uh, usually mix 1 gram and 250 mLs or 2 grams and 500, okay? And it, but it gives you a concentration of 4 milligrams per milliliter, okay? So we administer it at 2 to 4 milligrams a minute. If you give only one dose of lidocaine, we usually start it at two. If you give two doses, we usually give three. If we give the third dose, we start at four, okay? And then you reduce the maintenance infusion by 50% if the patient's over 70. So again, if I normally would start it at two milligrams a minute, I'd only start it at one milligram a minute. And when you guys start to learn drug calculations, we'll be going to definitely go over that and, and how to set it correctly. So your pediatric bolus is usually one milligram per kilo. And again, uh, for a IO, if you have to sedate, I usually start with five, uh, five milligrams of uh, uh, IV push and then or IO push, and then I I slowly give it until they they the discomfort goes away. Uh, again, guys, I will tell you for pediatric maintenance infusions, um, guys, uh, in all the time I've ever done this, don't worry about the pediatric infusion there. So mix 300 and 250, and it gives you one mic per kilo per minute, and you usually start, uh, and again, so again, 10, 10 to 50 micrograms per kilogram per minute is the, the lidocaine pediatric maintenance bolus dose, all right? Remember the bolus dose, one milligram per kilogram, okay? That's what we're after. All right, we can give it IVIO. It can actually be given through the endotracheal tube. The problem with going down the ET tube is, is that it's called drowning a patient. And so we don't really like to do that. Sometimes we actually mix the lidocaine in with the with the KY jelly to help numb the throat when you're doing an, an endotracheal intubation. Uh, this is a very acceptable thing to do in certain protocols. Uh, and again, your pregnancy class, pretty safe drug. Uh, we we it's again it's it's given to a lot of of, of pregnant patients. Uh, again, episiotomies, they have no problem uh, with. As a matter of fact, they want to be numb. All right, that's going to do it for the, the lidocaine. Uh, again, study this drug hard, especially the maintenance, how to make the maintenance strips. Make sure that you understand that, and make sure you understand the dosing regimen. I'll see you guys on the next video.